uh, data analyst here at GPCOG and Tegan Vittori, uh, one of our community engagement specialists who's going to help uh, with the meeting and is involved in Vision Zero as well. Uh, this is a virtual webinar and workshop for Vision Zero for rural and island communities. We had two in-person workshops last week. We had one up in Gray uh, and, and another in Bridgeton on Saturday, but we did want to provide a, a virtual option as well. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. Okay, today's agenda, we're gonna just quickly cover who we are, um, talk about what is Vision Zero and the safe system approach. We'll talk about what is a Vision Zero action plan, and then we'll review some local crash data uh, in our region, and then open it up for comments and questions at the end. For the comments and questions, uh, I think what we'll do is uh, give you, we'll promote you all to panelists or give you the option to join as a panelist and you can uh, accept or not depending on your situation. Uh, we also sh should have the Q&A function enabled. So if you have a question as we're going through, feel free to um, write that in and we can either try and answer it as we're going, one of us, or uh, address it at the end. And then lastly, this meeting is being uh, recorded. So real quickly, who we are, uh, what is Greater Portland Council of Governments? Uh, we, our acronym is GBCOG. We are a regional planning organization. We were established in 1969. Uh, we offer a range of planning services and programs. Uh, just to give you some highlights, we have a, an economic development department that provides a variety of programs and loans and funding assistance to locally owned small businesses. We have a brownfields program that leverages federal funding from the EPA to clean up brownfield sites in the region. We have a cooperative purchasing program that coordinates the bulk purchases of products like road salt and heating fuels and signs and bulk paper and office supplies that uh, municipalities use uh, in order to save money. We have a transportation team, um, hence the Vision Zero project. And um, we also have a sustainability team that does climate action planning and a planning team that helps municipalities with um, local planning efforts, comprehensive plans, neighborhood master plans, those types of projects. We're also home to PACs. So because the greater Portland region is an urban area that's greater than 200,000 people, uh, we're required to have a metropolitan planning organization. And so PACS, as the metropolitan planning organization, directs how a portion of state and federal funds for transportation are spent in the region. Uh, and so through PACS, we direct the spending of about 25 million in transportation funds annually. Um, GPCOG, we're funded through a combination of member dues, state and federal grants, uh, and I'd suggest going to our website, gpcog.org, um, to learn more about all the different um, work we do. Those are some of the highlights, but there's really a lot of a lot of things that we do. The Our GPCOG region is uh, shaded in green here. It's essentially Cumberland County, plus or minus uh, a few towns. And then the PAX region is different. It's 18 municipalities that make up the Portland urbanized area. And that's on the right. This is our project team. Uh, myself, Lucy, and uh, Tegan are here today. Emmy uh, couldn't make it. So what is Vision Zero? This is um, our second Vision Zero plan. Uh, we just finished one for the PAX region earlier this year. It was adopted in May. Uh, and I thought what we'd do is get started. Um, we, we put together a video for that project that really helps humanize some of the, the data and the statistics that we'll be showing later on. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this video for you. It's very short, it's about three minutes long. I've wrecked a few cars by being intoxicated. Oops. 
Someone had like rear-ended us. And I was taking a bend a little too fast, and I hit the curb, and my car will sort of run off the road when and riding my bike. I was T-boned in an intersection with my mom. I was uh, hit hit by a car on Baxter Boulevard um, on a bicycle. I know a couple people who've been hit by cars um, while they were biking or walking. The car behind me stopped and it was within two feet of my car. The third car behind was doing 65 miles an hour. It told, she totaled three cars and messed up my neck. I got three plates in my neck now. Luckily, I hit them you know, it didn't come into the side of the car, but the car in front of me, and there was a fatality that the person in the back seat behind the driver died because of the impact. One of my friends was just killed in a motorcycle accident, crashed his motorcycle at about one in the morning um, in, uh, in uh, June. I lost my 23-year-old daughter in Portland, Maine. On November 1st, 2016, she got hit by a distracted driver and she died nine days later. How many people do you think should be killed or seriously injured in traffic crashes? Should be zero. Zero. None. Yeah. Zero. I think people really should really be staying alive. Well, in the perfect world, yeah, nobody gets hurt. Zero. <laughs> nobody should have to die in traffic accidents. I would love it that nobody was to have to die. None. <laughs> there really shouldn't be accidents. I think that should be zero, yeah. A zero is a pretty good number, I think. It should be zero. It's a daily struggle every day to live without her. So to the people out there, come together and make a change, you know, so we have zero deaths. So that's why we're doing this work, is to prevent stories like that. Um, big picture perspective, um, about 42,000 people die each year on our nation's road. In Maine, it's around 170 people each year, and that's not counting injuries. In 2022, there are about 7,700 uh, severe injuries on main roads, and the trends are not getting any better. We're going to look at some of the local trends um, later on, but we've plateaued for a little bit, and then, if anything, we're getting worse. It's also not a new problem. So since the advent of the automobile, crashes have always been an issue. Um, we're going to take on a quick spin through history just to provide some background and context uh, uh, as to how we got to where we are now. So there's a historian, Peter Norton, that uh, wrote a, a journal article that describes four major paradigms in the history of traffic safety in the U.S. The citation is below on this slide. Um, and the first period is safety first. This is 1900s to 1920s. Cars were new at the time. Not many people owned them. They were considered pleasure vehicles. So owning a car was similar to uh, nowadays owning a yacht. And public opinion really recognized the danger at the time posed by cars, especially to pedestrians and vulnerable users. And uh, if you can imagine the streets were full of people walking, uh, biking, horse and carriages, et cetera. And the public really expected car owners to drive safely and responsibly and yield to those other uses. And this is just a really amazing poster that was shared um, by some folks in New Gloucester uh, at the time that it's 1905, uh, automobile warning, automobiles are hereby forbidden running through the village at a speed exceeding eight miles per hour, uh, really uh, illustrates the sentiment at the time. So that all changed when we entered the period of control between the 1920s and 1960s. Uh, more people owned more car, more people owned cars as they uh, became uh, less expensive. The focus shifted towards controlling non-driver behaviors. Uh, and so this is when the term jaywalking was invented. 
Jay is a slang word at the time. It meant something similar to country bumpkin. So a jaywalker was someone not used to walking in the city. The focus at the time really was bringing order to the road. Um, it's also the time when all when uh, speed limits were set and um, you know universal signs like stop signs, traffic signals, crosswalks, um, really like bringing order to uh, the traffic flow on our roads. And unfortunately, um, you know, giving most of the control to vehicles um, as the and the responsibility really shifting to um, pedestrians and, and bicyclists and others to get out of the way. Shifted with uh, crashworthiness, um, the focus really shifted towards solutions to make vehicles safer. Uh, around this time, uh, our country exceeded 50,000, uh, fatalities exceeded 50,000 people per year, and we began to accept crashes as inevitable. I think we all um, have seen these ads by Volvo and kind of think of Volvo as safe vehicles. When we plateaued on vehicle safety, the focus shifted towards individual responsibility. So the idea being that you know, with enough education and enforcement, we can get everyone um, to do the right thing and really drive down um, these trends. We're now entering the era of Vision Zero, which is a more holistic approach to traffic safety. Uh, and so this is a definition from the Vision Zero Network, which is a really great resource if you have a chance, if you would like to learn more about Vision Zero. Uh, it's a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries while increasing safe, healthy, equitable mobility for all. First implemented in Sweden in the 1990s, Vision Zero has proved successful across Europe, and now it's gaining momentum in major cities. Um, key point here is that unlike these other paradigms, Vision Zero has proven successful in Sweden uh, and in Europe. Sweden was able to uh, cut their numbers by more than half, and they're continuing on that downward trend. Uh, in the US, there's a really big push to adopt Vision Zero. Um, more, most recently, there's, uh, from what I've heard, there's over 500 communities across the country with Vision Zero action plans. Uh, and when you look at the population of those communities, that's more than half the US population lives in a city or a county with a, a Vision Zero plan in place. And the US DOT has adopted Vision Zero as the safe system approach. Uh, and one of the things I didn't realize at first when uh, beginning this work is how much uh, Vision Zero is, is more than just a target. It's really meant to be a change in perspective. And so this is a graphic that shows uh, the safe system approach. Uh, there's six principles around the outer ring. These are meant to frame how we think about safety. And then the five elements on the inside are really um, specific crash risks that we need to work to mitigate. So we're gonna take a quick uh, spin around the, the safe streets graphic here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, death and serious injury is unacceptable. This is vision zero at its core, zero deaths, zero serious injuries. Um, you know, changing our, our thought pattern so that crashes are not inevitable. There's something that we can do about this. Humans make mistakes. We can't expect perfect behavior. We don't stop making mistakes just because we're behind the wheel. That said, those mistakes shouldn't kill. We need to work to design our roads to anticipate mistakes, uh, to be a little bit more forgiving of them. Humans are vulnerable. Our bodies have physical limitations. We can only tolerate so much force or impact. Uh, so we need to design our roads that are centered around what those human tolerances are, not necessarily just what the vehicle tolerances are. And this is a common graphic that is used to illustrate just how vulnerable we are, especially as pedestrians. Um, so in this graphic, if you're hit by a car at 20 miles an hour, 
you have a 87% chance of making it out without a serious injury or death. Uh, that drops dramatically down to 27% if you're hit by a car at 40 miles an hour. And I think we can all relate to, uh, you know, from our driving experience, how quickly it is, how easy it is to go from 20 to 40 miles an hour. But um, what a big difference that makes if you're struck by a car. Uh, responsibility is shared. It's not just one person's fault. Uh, everyone's responsible for making our roads safe. That goes to you know the traffic engineers, designing roads, legislators, car manufacturers, researchers, drivers. We're all in it together. And uh, we also need to address issues early rather than react afterwards, which is partly what this action plan is about. And finally, redundancy is crucial. So we need to strengthen all elements of the transportation transportation system so we'll have layers of defense. And then going through the inner circle, safe users, um, whether you're walking, biking, driving, we need everyone to make safe choices. Safe vehicles, we need vehicles that minimize the risk to occupants and to others. So in the first generation of you know, in vehicle safety improvements, we had seat belts, airbags, anti-lock brakes. Um, nowadays, we have collision avoidance systems, lane detection warnings, backup cameras. Uh, vehicles are getting safer and safer. And hopefully, those, uh, those technologies trickle down into the lower cost uh, vehicles as well. Some of the things that we are missing is the impact your vehicle will have on other people, especially pedestrians. Uh, just for an example, the cyber truck came out recently. And um, I, I heard that the cyber, it would, they, it cannot be sold in Europe because it doesn't pass pedestrian protection laws. I guess the countries in Europe, uh, a vehicle has to have a, a crumple zone uh, if it hits for in case it hits a pedestrian in, in the US, we don't have that. Um, so I thought that was interesting. We also have very fancy vehicle displays um, that can be distracting as well. So those are areas that we uh, certainly can improve upon. Safe speeds, we need the right speeds for the right context. Um, we need to design roads that encourage people to drive slower, essentially. Uh, and then safe roads. We need roads designed to anticipate human error. Uh, and the way that intersections, crossings, roads are designed has a huge influence on how we drive and, and how safe we are. And I'll show you a couple examples of that uh, in a minute. And then lastly, post-crash care. We need quick access to medical care uh, when crashes do occur. Uh, you know, the fire EMS teams, they need to have what they need. We need to make sure the crash site is safe. We need to study the, the crash sites thoroughly so we can figure out what happened and, and learn from, from what went wrong. And so that's the Vision Zero and the safe system approach. Again, safe system, it is the US DOT's version of Vision Zero, essentially. And just a couple examples of safe road design. The Federal Highway Administration, they've developed uh, the Proven Safety Counters Countermeasures Initiative, which is 28 safety treatments and strategies that are um, research has shown they're proven to reduce uh, crashes. So there's a whole website devoted to this. Uh, if you Googled um, FHWA Proven Safety Countermeasures, you know, you'd see them. Oops. So one example, crosswalk visibility enhancements, uh, making sure a crosswalk is lighted, making uh, really enhancing the visibility of the crosswalk with um, placards and signs in the center, up to 42% reduction in pedestrian crashes. Rectangular rapid flashing beacons, RRFBs, up to a 47% reduction in pedestrian crashes. 
pedestrian refuge islands, up to 56% reduction pedestrian crashes. Centerline rumble strips, up to 64% reduction in head-on fatal and severe crashes. Um, then you also have shoulder rumble strips as well. Uh, converting a signalized intersection to a roundabout has up to a 78% reduction in fatal and severe crashes. And lastly, this is not uh, listed on the FHWA website, but I wanted to point out that demonstration projects are a big part of Vision Zero as well and encouraged um, you know, through the safe system approach. It's a great way to pilot um, some new techniques, uh, some traffic calming measures, especially when it comes to um, bicycle and pedestrian safety and, and crossings. Okay, so what is a Vision Zero action plan? I'm gonna start with how this project is funded. So this is funded by a Safe Streets and Roads for All grant, which is just this really big opportunity. There's, um, it's within the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's um, multiple rounds of this grant, um, a, a tremendous amount of funding. Uh, we're now in the second round. There's two major categories. There's planning and demonstration grants and implementation grants. Uh, there's $100,000 to $10 million for planning and demonstration grants uh, per project. Implementation grants are in the range of $2.5 million to $25 million. Uh, and the implementation grants fund actual in-the-ground projects, uh, real improvements. The caveat is that in order to get an implementation grant, you need to have an action plan in place. So what we're working on is an action plan. Um, what our goal is um, when we finish the action plan is to really like put together an application for uh, an implementation grant. The, they, they will likely be uh, competitive implementation grants. Um, so the caveat to that is that if we're not successful in implementation grants, there's lots of other uh, grants within the bipartisan infrastructure law that we could potentially apply for. Uh, and having a plan in place really helps give us a leg up for those uh, opportunities. And then even within uh, the state, there's different opportunities that we're having a vision zero plan um, really um, helps give us a leg up. And then just a little bit more on our our efforts here. So the plan we did last year, that was for the PAX communities. Uh, we're calling it the urban and uh, suburban uh, Vision Zero action plan. What we're working on now is Vision Zero for rural and island communities. So it's all the communities in magenta in this map. And here are some key components of Vision Zero action plan. Uh, the action plans are all going to look a little different, but Federal Highway really wants to make sure that these are addressed in each plan. So say, starting with safety analysis, we need to look at local crash data and trends. Uh, ultimately, we need to prioritize locations uh, and potential projects. We need to include a way to measure our progress. Uh, we'll need a leadership commitment so that our plan will ultimately be adopted by uh, the Jibicog Executive Committee, but within each town, the town would likely need to um, adopt a Vision Zero policy or or adopt or get on with this plan. Uh, we also have an advisory panel and then community engagement, which is really what we're up to uh, this month and, and last month. Best way to, to get a sense of what an action plan is would be to check out the one that we did last year. It was adopted in May, uh, and it's on our website, visionzerogreaterportland.org. And just give you a sense of our general timeline. Uh, we launched the project in September. We started raising awareness about it, established an advisory panel. Uh, we're now on phase two, identifying issues. So we are fully engaged, um, working on public and stakeholder engagement, um, 
and then uh, as well as analyzing crash data. Uh, next, we're going to be looking towards finding solutions, uh, identifying priority locations, and formulating uh, different action steps. And then finally, drafting the plan in March and April of next year. We'll review the draft with the advisory panel. It'll also be open for public comment, and ultimately, we'll seek adoption of the plan uh, by the GPCOG Executive Committee. So it's a quick project. Really, the focus is on getting the region and the individual communities eligible to apply for round three implementation grants uh, or other federal grant programs under the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Lucy to talk about local crash data. Hi everyone, I'm Lucy. I'm a data analyst here at GPCOG. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna run us through some of the crash trends that we're seeing in the region. Um, so first going through by the different sort of sub-regions that we're looking at, we have the Lakes region, Gray, New Gloucester, Pamela, and Durham, and the islands. So starting with the Lakes region, um, this is looking over the past 10 years at fatal and injury crashes. We see that there's been uh, around one to six fatal crashes per year and anywhere from 70 to 112 cra uh, severe injury crashes. Um, and then I think, you know, there's up and down within that, but the thing that we're concerned about is sort of that uptrend over the past few years. Um, going on to the gray New Gloucester, Pownall, and Durham region, um, we see once again that uptick over the past few years since um, 2020. And uh, around, well, there, 2022, there were no fatal crashes, but around one to three or four fatal crashes per year and anywhere from 100 to 138 uh, se severe injury crashes per year as well. Looking at our island communities, uh, these communities, well, in some cases in 2019 and 2022, actually achieved vision zero of, you know, not having any fatal or severe injury crashes. Um, but there are still uh, issues. Um, we see uh, fatal crashes. There was actually another fatal crash this year in 2023 on Long Island um, and a few injury crashes as well. Uh, and then looking overall, so our crash analysis for the project is going to consider crashes from 2018 to 2023. And looking at the overall numbers by subregion, we see um, uh, 11 fatalities and 53 severe injuries in the Durham Gray, New Gloucester, and Pownall region, 17 fatalities and 66 injuries, uh, severe injuries in the Lakes region and one fatality and three severe injuries in, uh, on our islands. Uh, getting a little bit into the types and conditions, there's all sorts of things you can dive into here. So this is really just an overview. Um, I think the interesting thing from this is that over a third of all crashes in these regions involve a vehicle going off the road. And these crashes tend to be particularly dangerous, and they make up for over half of all fatal and severe injury crashes. Um, these crashes are also often associated with speeding or going too fast for uh, road conditions. Um, there's some things that are uh, more common in our rural regions than in our urban and suburban ones, and so that's something that we're considering as well. We see that 44% of all crashes involve wildlife or bad weather. Um, so these things may seem like they're out of our control, but there are things that we can do to address them. Um, and then finally, looking at vulnerable user crashes. Um, so as Rick was saying, a vulnerable user is anyone who's sort of not encased within a hard metal shell of a car. 
um, and crashes for these folks tend to be much more severe. Um, so in this region, there were 111 motorcycle crashes, which included 11 fatalities and 19 severe injuries, 10 bicycle crashes, uh, which included one severe injury, and 22 pedestrian crashes, um, which included th three fatalities and five severe injuries. Um, and while these vulnerable user crashes make up less than 3% of overall crashes, they account for 27% of fatalities and severe injuries. Um, so these vulnerable user crashes are definitely a little bit less common in the rural regions. Um, we're also aware that oftentimes that's because people are uh, too uncomfortable to walk or bike on their roads um, because they feel unsafe there. Um, so we're gonna be taking a special look at um, where these crashes are occurring as well. I think it's important to note as well that every bike and pedestrian crash that was reported uh, led to an injury of some type or a fatality. Um, and then this is a heat map of fatal and severe injury crashes in the region. Um, the blue dots on there are severe injuries and the red dots are fatalities. Um, this is an overall look and then the next few slides are gonna take us into the different subregions. Um, first up we have the lakes region. Um, so the big hotspot in the region overall is the Naples Causeway there, but we see crashes all over the region, especially along Route 302. Um, and I'll get into the different types of locations where we're seeing crashes as well in a minute. Um, here we have Gray, New Gloucester, Durham, and Pownall. Um, the big, well, yeah, sure. the big hotspot for that is uh, over there on in Durham on um, Route 136 at Rabbit Road and Quaker Meeting House Road. Um, and yeah, through, crashes throughout the re region as well. And then on the islands, there's actually no fatal or severe crashes on Fry Island. Um, and then we have three severe crashes on Chibig and one uh, fatal crash on Long Island. Um, by far the most uh, dangerous area in the region that had the most um, fatal or severe crashes was the Naples Causeway. This area has had six serious injury crashes since 2018, including one this year. Um, this is a pretty busy area um, where you also see a lot of pedestrians and uh, some pretty quick changes from high speeds coming into town to uh, a low speed area. So there's a lot of conflict between vehicles and uh, also two severe crashes that involve pedestrians. Um, then looking at the sort of types of locations that we're seeing crashes at, there's sort of three main types. The first is these uh, sort of rural cross crossroads where we have one road um, that doesn't stop so, and it's usually higher speed. Um, this example is Route 136 in Durham. Um, and then we have a slower, smaller road crossing and they have a stop sign. Um, and yeah, we see a lot of crashes involving uh, improper turns or uh, conflict between cars while they're turning at this type of area. Um, our second type is these long straight stretches. Um, and we tend to see a lot of crashes involving um, speeding and going off the road on these types of roads. Um, this is Harrison Road in Naples. And then <laughs> this last one. Sorry, Rick, I'm no, uh, keep on going back and forth there. Um, this last one is uh, at curves in the road um, where we see more issues with cars staying on the road um, or, you know, cars going off the road um, or into the other lane. And um, yeah, I think 
of note as well as both of those second types tend to be single vehicle crashes. So they're not necessarily um, crashing into other cars, but more commonly going off the road. Um, and we're going to be diving into more data analysis as we, sorry, as we move on, but um, that's an overview for you all. Great. Thanks, Lucy. So at this point, I think we'd like to uh, open it up to any questions or comments. We'll stop sharing my screen and we can uh, promote folks to panelists. Feel free to accept or deny depending on 